Hello, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure today uh, to be presenting uh, one of the presentations related to the cardiac pacemakers, uh, indications and implications. Uh, uh, I'm Dr. Mazen Taufi. I'm a professor of cardiology in, in Shams University Cardiology Department. I'm interested in uh, cardiac electrophysiology, pacing and cardiac rhythm management. Today, we are going to discuss uh, the topic of indications and implications of the pacemaker implantations. Uh, without going into details, we are going first to, to, to have uh, a quick uh, um, uh, revision for the different forms of pacing rhythm disorders or the heart rhythm disorders which indicate uh, cardiac pacing or artificial pacing. Of course, we know that cardiac conduction system starts by the natural pacemaker of the heart, which is the SE node, located in the high right atrium. Its rate is around 60 to 100 beats per minute at rest, and with exercise, of course, it's increasing according to the physiological needs of the body. And then the conduction goes to through, through the atria and then uh, uh, reconnects again through the AV node or the atrioventricular node located at the lower interatrial septum, where it receives impulses from the atria after SE nodal activation, and then it delivers impulses to the Hesperkinji system down to the ventricular system. It delivers at a rate between 40 and 60 beats per minute if the SE node fails to deliver impulses. And then the bundle of His, which is the AV bundle, begins conduction to the ventricle at the AV junctional tissue uh, before division into two bundle branches, left bundle branch and right bundle branch. And also it acts as a backup pacing in case of failure of both SE node and AV node at a rate of uh, 40 to 60 beats per minute. And then the Purkinje network of fibers after bundle branching and Purkinje fibers with direct activation of the ventricular myocardium, it moves impulses through the ventricles for contraction, what we call electromechanical coupling. It provides escape rhythm in case of failure of all the conduction system or especially failure of the conduction at the AV node with an intrinsic rate between 20 and 40 beats per minute. And as a whole, this is a normal sinusrhythm where the SE node starts uh, uh, stimulation, uh, the natural pacemaker, followed by propagation of the impulse or through the conduction system to start the cardiac beat. This is an impulse from the SE node propagating into the atria via atrial depolarization tissues, forming the P wave on the surface electrogram. And then some physiological delay at the AV node, where it's present at the baseline at the AV or the PR interval, or the PR segment, and then conduction through the uh, his bundle and bundle branches before starting the QRS complex, which is the contraction of the ventricular tissue or conduction in the ventricular tissue with propagation of ventricular depolarization, which appears on the surface ECG as a QRS complex on the surface electrogram, followed by ST segment elevation, which is a start of repolarization, which is a plateau phase of repolarization, and the final phase of repolarization, which is the final rapid phase, with potassium outflux in the uh, uh, phase where the T wave appears on the surface ECG, and therefore the normal conduction appears in every cardiac cycle. This is a normal ECG activation, and this pattern of depolarization with the atria followed by the ventricle results into the efficient mechanical contraction, which is the purpose to pump blood, which is the main contractile function of the heart, what we call the electromechanical cup. What happens actually in some pathological conditions is to have disorders in these normal heart rhythms, which require backup artificial pacing, which is the topic of our discussion today. The bradycardia can be classified according to the pathophysiologic site of origin into disorder of impulse formation and disorder of impulse conduction. And by the way, this is the main differentiation or main classification of different types of cardiac rhythm disorders, whether it is bradycardia or tachycardia. Both of them can be divided into two big categories, the disorders of impulse formation and disorders of impulse conduction. In bradycardia, which are the main pacing indications, disorders of impulse formation can be at the level of the sinus node, like sinus arrest, sinus bradycardia, bradytachy syndrome, or what we call sick sinus syndrome. This is the sinus arrest, which is a failure of the nodal tissue at the SE node to discharge at a time. So therefore, there is absence of complete atrial activation, absence of atrial depolarization, where there is a period of asystole or period of ventricular asystole or what we call a boost on the surface electrogram. It may be an episodic or maybe due to uh, permanent conditions that require pacemaker, as we will see in the indication. And then sinus bradycardia. 
which is a diminished rate of depolarization of the SE node by decreasing the automaticity of the SE node. So the SE node depolarizes very slowly at a rate lower than 60 beats per minute. If the patient is symptomatic and the rhythm is persistent and does not uh, meet the physiological demands of the patient, especially with some form of exercise or during effort, and it is irreversible, it requires a pacemaker, by the way. Six sinus syndrome, which we previously known as Prady Tacky syndrome, these are intermittent episodes of slow and fast rates from the SCE nodes or the atrial conduction tissue, where there are periods of bradycardia with the heart rate less than 60 beats per minute, alternating or maybe episodic forms of tachyarrhythmias, especially atrial tachyarrhythmias, at a rate of 100 beats per minute or higher. This can be called a, 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 a global uh, uh, nomination as a sinus node disease. Patient may have periods of chronotropic incompetence, slow heart rate, bradycardia, poses, sinus arrest, and be episodic tachycardia, special atrial tachycardia, and more famously, the atrial fibrillation. This uh, constitutes around two thirds of the pacemaker indications or pacemaker implants for uh, this diagnosis. And the second category, the abnormality of impulse conduction. This is a famous uh, uh, indication of cardiac pacemakers, in abnormality of impulse conduction all through the cardiac conduction tissue, like exit block at the level of the sinus node or the sinoatrial junction, and then atrioventricular block by its all degrees, first, second, third degree, and even uh, fascicular degrees of block, which is a block at the level of the his bundle fascicles or his bundle branches, left bundle branch, right bundle branch, or the two divisions of the left bundle branch, anterior fascicle and posterior fascicle. This is a form of exit block, which is transient block of the impulse to exit from the SE node to the atrial tissue. Pacing in this condition is rare, unless it's very frequent, symptomatic, and irreversible. First degree AV block is a persistent form of consistent uh, prolongation of the conduction at the atrioventricular tissue due to the atrioventricular disease, where the PR interval, which is normally up to 200 milliseconds, is more than 200 milliseconds, like in this case, it's around 320 milliseconds. So this is a delayed conduction, but it is a, uh, a fixed conduction, and it is due to many conditions and sometimes maybe congenital. But in most of the cases, it is not symptomatic unless a patient is having severe diastolic dysfunction or severe hemodynamic compromise. So it's a rare indication of pacing, as we'll see. Second degree AV block can be divided into two types, Mobitz type 1 and Mobitz type 2. Mobitz type 1 is a progressive prolongation of the PR interval until there is a failure to conduct one uh, peed from the atria to the ventricle by complete failure at this step of conduction at the AV node. Usually this is what we call a lower degree of AV block and usually is uh, asymptomatic and does not need indication of pacing. But in some cases where there are intermittent higher degrees of AV block, there may be some indication of pacing. But starting from this second degree AV block of Mobitz type 2, where there is a fixed block at the level of the AV node with a fixed rate of block 2 to 1, 3 to 1, 3 to 2, where the atrial rate is normal between 60 and 100, while the ventricular rate is usually half or one third of the ventricular rate. This is a higher degree of block. Usually this is persistent. Usually this is an indication for cardiac pacing because the ventricular rate is usually low for the patient to meet his physiological needs, especially during the times of exercise. And finally, the third degree AV block, or what we call complete AV block, where there is a complete dissociation between the atrial activation and the ventricular conduction. Here, the atrial tissue is activated by the SE node at the normal rate from 60 to 100, and it increases uh, normally with exercise, but the ventricular rate is actually the escape rate, coming either from the AV node, from the HIS bundle, or down from the uh, Hisperkinji system, which we call the escape prism. This escape prism can vary from 40, 60, can be wide complex, can be narrow complex, according to the site of the escape prism. And uh, to be uh, important to notice, the escape prism, if it's coming after or superior to the His bundle, we call it suprahesian block, it's usually narrow complex and a rate of 40 to 60 beats per minute. When it comes lower than the level of the His, we call it infrahesian block coming from the lower his bundle or the his bundle branches or the left or right bundle branch or any Purkinje tissue fibers in the ventricle. It's called an infrahesian block. Usually it is a white QRS complex and the rate between 20 and 40 beats per minute. And actually all these escape rhythms or most of them are transiently acting uh, escape rhythms. Therefore, 
All of these cases are indicated for pacemaker implantation. The third level is the fascicular block where there is a block at the level of the fascicles. Like here, right bundle branch block and left posterior hem block. The second one is the right bundle branch block and left anterior hem block. The third one is the complete left bundle branch block. These are all called uh, fascicular blocks. If it involves two fascicles only, it is called bifascicular block. If it involves more than two fascicles, like involving any degree of atrioventricular block, it's called a trifascicular block. And in some cases, there is indication for pacing in these forms of fascicular blocks. Like this, trifascicular block, where there is complete block at the level of the right bundle branch and a block at the level of the left anterior fascicle or left posterior fascicle together with a lower degree of AV block. This is called trifascicular block. And in many cases of trifascicular block, there are indications for basing as we will see. So this is to summarize the indications or the classifications of bradycardia, which are mostly the causes or the, uh, for pacemaker implantation or the indication of pacemaker implantation, either due to impulse formation disorder or impulse conduction disorder. Pacemakers actually are electronic devices that stimulate the heart with electrical impulses to maintain or restore normal heartbeat back to the physiological needs of the patient. Actually, more than 60 years ago, in the early 50s and then late 50s, complete heart block was treated using electrodes directly attached to the heart. This early observation instills the idea that cardiac electrical failure can be controlled and can be corrected. It ultimately led to the development of the totally implanted internal pacemaker devices through the cardiac uh, venous system like we all know nowadays. All cardiac pacemakers consist of two components, a pulse generator, PG, which provides the electrical impulse for myocardial stimulation, and one or more electrodes, we usually call them leads, which deliver the electrical impulse from the generator to the myocardium. Pacemakers, according to the number of the leads, can be divided or can be single chamber pacemakers or dual chamber pacemakers, as we will see. This is an implantable pacemaker system where the pulse generator is seen here, where it contains all the electrical circuits needing for uh, pulse initiation and propagation. And these are the wires or the leads which are connected to the pulse generator and delivered through the venous system of the body to the heart uh, to be attached to the myocardial tissue for delivering the impulse generated in the pulse generator. This is the pulse generator. It's uh, uh, multiple compo components. It contains the battery, which provides energy for sending the electrical impulse to the heart, and then circuit to control the different times and intervals and operations of the pacemaker, and then a connector to connect these pulse generator to the attached electrodes, which will deliver these impulses down to the cardiac tissue. And then these are the leads or the insulated wires, which are conduction electrodes to deliver the electrical impulses from the pulse generator down to the heart at the myocardial tissue. It sends normal cardiac depolarizations and it sends the cardiac uh, uh, depolarization signals from the pulse generator down to the myocardium. It can be passive fixation, meaning there are tines at the tip of these electrodes to be uh, fixed passively by fibrosis at the level of the implantation site or it can be active fixation where it, is, it needs a screw in delivery to active, actively fix it into the myocardial tissue. As we uh, just told that single chamber and dual chamber pacemaker systems are the most commonly used pacemaker. Single pacemakers uh, having pulse generator and only one pacing lead either in the right ventricular tissue or the right ventricular site, most commonly in the right ventricular apex. And nowadays we are shifting uh, to the right ventricular septum and uh, the atrial site for single chamber pacemaker is in the right atrium, especially in the right atrial appendix. So the pacing lead is implanted in the atrium of ventricle, depending on the chamber needed to be paced and senses. And this is the paced rhythm recognition. This is a, a, a electrogram or a tracing of paced ventricle at a rate of 60 beats per minute, where we will see here what we call the spike. The spike here is an artifact which appears on the surface electrogram created by the pacemaker electrical impulse output at the level of the pulse generator followed by depolarization of the ventricular tissue creating the ventricular activation by the pacemaker we call this the pacemaker risk here the activated uh, uh, tissue is the ventricle so this is a ventricular pacemaker this is a paste rhythm recognition in a single chamber pacemaker system at the level of the ventricle 
And here it's the spike is followed by activation of the atrial tissue, which appears here as a P wave. This is a paced atrial rhythm. This is an atrial pacing of a rate of 60 beats per minute. This is a paced rhythmic cognition in case of single chamber pacemakers in atria, <coughs> single chamber atrial pacemaker. The main advantage of single chamber pacemaker is uh, they are easy to implant because we implant only one lead and pacemaker itself is usually smaller and takes a uh, shorter time during implantation. While the main disadvantage of this single chamber pacemaker system, they stimulate only the atria or the ventricles, so they do not provide a ventricular, uh, atrioventricular synchrony in case of uh, ventricular pacing only. So ventricular paced pacing in many cases, especially if there is a good uh, form of sinus rhythm, is linked to heart failure symptoms and development of atrial fibrillation. Single atrial lead does not provide ventricular backup in case of single chamber atrial pacemaker. So uh, during the progression of the disease, if there, if there is an, any form of atrioventricular conduction defect, the patient will not be backed up by ventricular conduction. So the uh, dual chamber pacemakers will provide both either atrial sensing or pacing, ventricular sensing or pacing. So it provides synchronization between the atria and ventricle, provides sensing and pacing in the atria if needed, and of course provides sensing and uh, uh, pacing in the ventricle if needed in case of progression, for example, of sick sinus syndrome or sinus node disorder or sinus node disease into an accompanying ovinodal disease with complete atrioventricular clock. This is a dual chamber pacing system where two leads are implanted and both are connected to the same pulse generator. One lead or one electrode is implanted in the atria, usually in the right atrial appendage, and the other lead is implanted in the ventricle, either in the right ventricular apex or the right ventricular septum. And this is a paced rhythm recognition of dual chamber pacing system. Here we have two spikes in case of pacing in the two chambers. One spike followed by atrial depolarization, which is a P wave, and the other spike after a nominated interval, we call it the EV interval, linked to the physiological PR interval of the patient before implantation, followed by depolarization of the ventricular tissue and pacing of the ventricle. These are the pacemakers. This is a dual chamber pacemaker animation where <coughs> we have an atrial lead in the right atrial appendage, followed by the ventricular lead present at the right ventricular apex. The most common indications for permanent pacemakers are sinus node dysfunction and high degree of atrioventricular block together with some other uh, uh, specific indications and some unique conditions we will see. Guidelines for implantation of cardiac pacemakers have been established by the task form jointly formed by the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, the Heart Rhythm Society, and also the European Society of Cardiology and European Heart Rhythm Associations have established similar guidelines. The, these societies divide the indications of pacemaker implantation into three specific categories or three specific classes. Class one, where the conditions where the implantation of pacemaker is considered necessary and beneficial. So here, benefit is much greater than the risk of implantation. Class two, which are conditions where the placement is indicated, but there is conflicting evidence or divergence of opinion between indicating the pacemaker implantation or avoiding the pacemaker in implantation. And it is subdivided into two subclasses, class 2A, where the way of evidence is in favor of efficacy, benefit is greater than the risk, and class 2B, the efficacy is less well established, here the benefit is greater than or equal to the risk. While class 3 recommendation is actually a contraindication. These are the conditions in which permanent pacing is not recommended, and in some cases it may be harmful, so risk is greater than the benefit, so there is no indication at all at the level of class 3. We call it contraindication for pacemaker. The pacemaker indications, pacing indication, usually require both symptoms and documented evidence of rhythm disorders. Symptoms include irritability, fatigue, uh, forgetfulness, palpitation, chest pain, dyspnea, weakness, dizziness, and most commonly presyncope and syncope. The documentation methods include patient bedside monitoring, 12 lead ECG, ambulatory monitoring, stress testing, and in some cases, electrophysiological testing in the cardiac cath lab. The main indication of pacemakers as enumeration, before we go into details of these indications, are sinus node dysfunction, acquired atrioventricular plug, chronic bifascicular or trifascicular plug, after an acute phase of myocardial infarction, 
the flexing curve, or what we call neurocardiogenic syncope and hypersensitive carotid sinus syndrome, post cardiac transplantation, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, pacing to detect and terminate tachycardias, like ventricular tachycardias in some cases, both dependent ventricular tachycardias or atrial fibrillation in some cases, patients with congenital heart disease, either congenital heart block or uh, structural congenital heart disease associated with uh, heart rhythm disorder or heart blocks. And finally, a specific indication for pacing not related to any form of bradycardia or any form of sinus node or AV node and dysfunctions, but it's mainly due to heart failure uh, therapy due to the presence of ventricular conduction disorder, which is called cardiac resynchronization therapy in patients with severe systolic heart failure. The first recommendation or indications are the group of sinus node dysfunction, like we see here. This is a form of sinus bradycardia. This is an example of uh, sinus bosis or sinus arrest. This is an example of sinus bose. This is sinoatrial exit block. This is the sinus node uh, six sinus syndrome or the praditachy syndrome, where there are alternating periods between tachycardia and sinus bosis or sinus blocks. The main indications are class one and class two indications. So all through the coming slides, we will only enumerate the class one and class two indications because these are the main indications for pacemakers in these different conditions. In sinus node dysfunction, class one indication includes documented symptomatic sinus bradycardia, including frequent sinus bosis, which produce symptoms and symptomatic sinus bradycardia that result from required drug therapy for medical condition, like patients with severe ischemic heart disease who indicate or who need uh, beta blockers or calcium antagonist and a heart rate control. And the symptomatic uh, sinus bradycardia in these patients may indicate pacing. Or any form of arrhythmias that needs uh, antiarrhythmic drugs with the secondary side effect of symptomatic sinus bradycardia with the need of these drugs for the treatment of these arrhythmias. The second indication is symptomatic chronotropic incompetence, which is failure to achieve 80% of the age predicted maximum heart rate during formal or informal stress test, or the inability to mount age-appropriate heart rate during activity of daily living. The class two indications are the sinus bradycardia with heart rate less than 40 beats per minute, but no clear association between these symptoms and bradycardia. But actually, the patient is symptomatic with dizziness, presyncope, and maybe syncope, or effort intolerance, and every time we examine this patient, we find sinus bradycardia. The second indication is unexplained syncope when clinically significant abnormalities of sinus node function are discovered or provoked in the electrophysiological studies. The minimally symptomatic patient with chronic heart rate less than 40 beats per minute while awake. Uh, these are the different indications of sinus node dysfunction indicating pacemaker. The second category is the blockage at the level of the AV node. This is an example of the second degree Mobitz type 1 AV block. We call it the Winkbach where there is a progressive prolongation of the PR interval until one P wave or one atrial signal is not delivered to the ventricle, resulting into a bose. This is a second example, which is the AV block second degree Mobitz type 2, where there is a fixed rate of block, and the ventricular rate is usually one half or one third or one fourth of the atrial rate, depending, about, uh, depending on the level of block or the degree of the second degree fixed block. And this is a third degree AV block where there is complete dissociation between atrial activation from the sinus node and ventricular activation from the escape tissue. Here there is a narrow uh, escape prism coming from the suprahessian tissue. And here there is a wide escape prism coming from the infrahessian tissues. In all these two types, we need, of course, pacemaker. This is another example where the patient is not having a sinus rhythm, he's having atrial fibrillation, but very slow and symptomatic uh, ventricular response. This slow ventricular response is due to either the medications given for AF control or due to the uh, conduction disorder in the AV node, either progressive degenerative atrioventricular block on top of the presence of underlying heart disease producing this atrial fibrillation, or uh, uh, due to the association of the AV nodal disease with the uh, uh, atrial disease resulting into atrial fibrillation, like for example, cardiomyopathies or valvular conditions in the heart, producing both atrial fibrillation and conduction disorder at the level of the AV node, resulting into this very slow symptomatic ventricular rate during the atrial fibrillation. This is another form of indication of pacing uh, due to atrioventricular block. 
The acquired AV block indications are, class one indication are the complete third degree AV block with or without symptom. Once diagnosed, it should be indicated for pacing. Symptomatic second degree AV block, Mobitz type one or type two. Exercise induced second or third degree AV block in the absence of myocardial infarction. Mobitz type two with widened QRS complex because in Mobitz type two with widened QRS complex, most of the cases will progress sooner or later into a complete form of AV block, therefore, pacemakers are indicated as a class one indication. The class two indication includes asymptomatic Mobitz type two with a narrow QRS complex, first degree AV block when there is hemodynamic compromise, because in first degree AV block, if it is fixed and does not meet the physiological demand of the patient because of atrioventricular desynchronization resulting into severe forms of diastolic dysfunction, and therefore the patient may be symptomatic by pulmonary venous congestions and other symptoms requiring uh, normalization of the AV timing, therefore pacing may be indicated in these conditions. Asymptomatic second degree AV block at intra or infrahesian levels found during an EP study. Symptomatic slow ventricular response in atrial fibrillation not related to medications. The, this is an example of uh, fascicular levels of block. This is a bifascicular block we, where we find a right bundle branch block and left anterior fascicular block. This is a bifascicular block. This is another level of fascicular block where there is a right bundle branch block and left anterior fascicular block together with fixed prolongation of the PR interval, uh, a form or a first degree of atrioventricular block. We call this a trifascicular block. In this patient, the trifascicular block progressed into complete heart block where the atrioventricular block progressed to complete atrioventricular uh, block where there is an AV dissociation. Uh, starting as bifascicular, followed by trifascicular, and followed by complete heart block. The chronic bifascicular or trifascicular blocks are also indications for pacemaker. They are indicated if there is advanced second degree AV block or intermittent third degree AV block like the last ECG we saw. Alternating bundle branch block where the fascicular block is uh, in the form of right bundle branch block alternating with left bundle branch block. So if there is another level of block, uh, it indicates a severe form or a very high degree of atrioventricular tissue conduction abnormality indicating pacing. Type two second degree AV block if it is present, like the last ECG where we see, if here the uh, second degree, uh, the atrioventricular block degree is not the first degree, if it is from the beginning a second degree AV block, especially Mobitz type two or Mobitz type one, so the indication of pacing is straightforward from the very beginning. The class two indications in uh, cases where there is chronic fascicular blocks are as a, either bifascicular or trifascicular block are in patients having syncope not demonstrated uh, to be due to AV block when other likely causes, especially ventricular tachycardia uh, are excluded. Or the incidental finding during an electrophysiologic study of markedly prolonged HV interval greater than 100 millisecond or pacing induced infrahesian block in a symptomatic patient. The HV interval in the electrophysiologic study is the conduction time or the time interval from the His bundle, which is located just below the AV node, to the first identifiable onset of ventricular depolarization or ventricular activation. If this time interval during the EV study is more than 100 millisecond, in cases of bifascicular or trifascicular block, this is a class two indica uh, indication for pacemakers. And finally, considered this form if associated with a neuromuscular degenerative diseases, uh, 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 including the cardiac uh, conduction tissue. So if this conduction tissue abnormality is in association with neuromuscular disorders like myotonic muscular dystrophy, herbs dystrophy, perineal muscle atrophy or dystrophy, with bifascicular or any levels of fascicular block with or without symptoms, this is considered a severe form of neuromuscular degenerations, including the cardiac conduction tissue and it indicates pacing in many cases. And the next indication is the blocks after acute myocardial infarction. This is an ECG demonstrating an acute form of inferior wall myocardial infarction, where as we see here, there is a complete AV dissociation where the atrial activation is in the sinus node and sinus bradycardia and the ventricular tissue is escaped by the escape prism coming here, maybe from the AV node or from the suprahistian escape. In case of acute myocardial infarction, pacemakers are indicated if there is persistent second degree AV block in the Hesperkinji system with alternating bundle branch block or third degree AV block within or below the Hesperkinji system after ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. 
Permanent ventricular pacing for transient advanced second or third degree infranodal block, infranodal block with associated bundle branch block. Permanent ventricular pacing for persistent and symptomatic second or third degree atrioventricular block. The class two indication in includes patients where there are some mild symptoms or asymptomatic, but there is a persistent second or third degree AV block at the level of the AV node after myocardial infarction. And the third indication or the fourth level of indications are the reflex syncope or the neurocardiogenic syncope, either due to neurocardiogenic uh, disorders or carotid sinus hypersensitivity syndromes. In all these syndromes, there are forms of tachycardia with palpitations followed by severe form of bradycardias and severe hypotension associated with syncope. These are the uh, neurocardiogenic forms of syncope, and this demonstration has been elicited during a tilt table testing, where the patient starts initially some form of sinus tachycardia, followed by bradycardia, and finally sinus arrest, complete asystole associated with inaudible blood pressure, and during that time the patient demonstrated syncope. The second form is the hypersensitive carotid sinus syndrome, where during carotid sinus massage here in the right carotid artery or the right carotid body, there is sinus bradycardia followed by a long pause associated with severe form of hypotension here and inaudible blood pressure and the patient started syncope immediately after this change in the blood pressure and the heart rate. The main indications for pacing in these cases are the recurrent syncope caused by either spontaneously occurring carotid sinus stimulation and carotid sinus pressure that induces ventricular asystole of more than three seconds. And the class two indications are uh, in patients having syncope without clear and provocative event and with hypersensitive carotid uh, uh, or cardiac inhibitory response of three seconds or longer of asystole. And it can be uh, considered also for significantly symptomatic neurocardiogenic syncope, especially the cardio inhibitory type associated with bradycardia, documented either spontaneously or at the time of tilt table testing. Some other specific and peculiar investigations include post cardiac transplantation, class one indication for persistent inappropriate or symptomatic bradycardia not expected to resolve, and for other class one indication of permanent pacing, class two indication considered in relative bradycardia is prolonged or recurrent, which limits the rehabilitation or discharge after the post-operative recovery period, and can be considered for syncope after cardiac transplantation, even when bradycardia has not been documented. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy may be indicated also for pacing in some cases. Of course, a class one indication if the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is associated with sick sinus syndrome or sinus node dysfunction and atrioventricular block at any degree. Class two indication includes medically refractory symptomatic patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with a significant resting or provoked left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. Here, pacing may be indicated for symptom release in the form of uh, abnormally moving the uh, interventricular septum paradoxically away from the mitral valve to try to reduce the degree of obstruction at the level of the left ventricular outflow tract. Pacing to prevent tachycardia is also indicated in some peculiar conditions, like sustained pose-dependent ventricular tachycardia with or without Q2, uh, QT prolongation, and reasonable for high-risk patient with congenital long QT syndrome, can be considered for the prevention of symptomatic drug refractory recurrent atrial fibrillation in a patient with coexisting sinus node dysfunction. Like we uh, discussed in the beginning, some patients with atrial fibrillation may be highly symptomatic to the degree that if they are given medication to control this atrial fibrillation, uh, due to the associated sinus node dysfunction, these patients may be have a bradycardia uh, uh, symptoms indicating pace. This is an example of both dependent ventricular tachycardia, where there are some forms of sinus bradycardia followed by boses, and this bose is followed by ventricular tachycardia. So here, pacing will regularize this bradycardia and prevent the development of ventricular tachycardia. Here, there's a patient with recurrent atrial fibrillation, highly symptomatic, but unfortunately, the patient is having also underlying sinus node dysfunction. So the patient will need uh, pacing or backup pacing for the sinus node dysfunction and also to maintain on the antiarrhythmic medications for the treatment of recurrent atrial fibrillation, trying to maintain rhythmic control or treat atrial fibrillation with a chronic rate control. Congenital heart disease is another indication. Class one indication includes advanced second or third degree AV block associated with symptomatic bradycardia, ventricular dysfunction, or low cardiac output. 
advanced second or third degree AV block, which is not expected to resolve or persist after seven days longer after cardiac surgery, corrective cardiac surgery. Sinus node dysfunction with a correlation of symptoms during each inappropriate bradycardia. Congenital third degree AV block with a white QRS escape rhythm, complex, complex ventricular activity or ventricular dysfunction. Congenital third degree AV block in an infant with a ventricular rate of less or equal than 55 beats per minute, or if associated with congenital heart disease with a ventricular rate of less or equal than 70 beats per minute, like in this condition, whereas congenital heart block associating congenital heart disease or an infant with a ventricular rate of around 35 to 40 beats per minute. So this is an indication for pacing. Class two indication indicates patients with congenital heart disease and sinus bradycardia for the prevention of recurrent episodes of intraatrial reentrant tachycardias in these congenital anomalies. Sinus node dysfunction may be here intrinsic or secondary to the antiarrhythmic treatment. Congenital third degree AV block beyond the first year of life with an average heart rate less than 50 beats per minute or abrupt pauses in ventricular rate with two or three times basic cycle lenses may be considered for transient post-operative third degree AV block that reverts to sinus rhythm with the residual bifascicular or trifascicular block, considered also for symptomatic sinus, asymptomatic sinus bradycardia after biventricular repair of congenital heart disease in patients with a resting heart rate less than 40 beats per minute or poses a ventricular rate longer than three seconds. And finally, the final indication for pacing recently recognized in the last 20 years is a cardiac resynchronization therapy. This is a special form of pacing in patients with severe systolic heart failure. This is a therapy referring to pacing techniques which change the degree of atrial and ventricular electromechanical desynchrony in patients with major atrial or ventricular conduction defects, especially left boundary branch block, acting by pre-exciting the left ventricular uh, uh, lateral free wall, acting as electrical bypass together with atrial sequential pacing to restore normal contraction pattern. And here it's mainly by normalizing the QRS duration, where the QRS is initially prolonged due to the conduction of normality, especially the left bounded branch block, narrowed by this biventricular pacing system in the cardiac resynchronization therapy, trying to restore the atrioventricular and inter- and intraventricular synchronization to improve the cardiac systolic function and improve the symptoms of severe systolic heart failure. So this is in association with optimized AV timing, improves the hemodynamic performance by forcing the left ventricle to complete its contraction and begin relaxation earlier in an appropriate time with the right ventricular activation, allowing to increase the ventricular filling parameters. Here, the biventricular pacing system in the CRT is composed of three leads. One lead in the atrium, in the right atrial appendage, and the second lead, like usual, in the right ventricle, in the right ventricular apex or septum. And the third lead goes through the coronary sinus far down to the left ventricular lateral free wall branches to pace the free wall of the left ventricle. And here is the system recognized under the X-ray, the right atrial lead, right ventricular lead, and the left ventricular lead placed on the surface of the LV via the coronary sinus. The main indications are class one indication where the patient with left ventricular systolic dysfunction with an injection fraction of 35% or less, sinus rhythm, left bundle branch block, and functional New York Heart Association class two, three or four symptoms with, uh, while these patients are in optimal guideline directed medical therapy with a QRS duration of 150 millisecond or more. CRT with or without ICD is indicated in these patients as a class one indication. While class two indication include other categories of these patients with systolic heart failure. If the left ventricular ejection fraction is equal or less than 35% with sinus rhythm, left bundle branch block, with New York Heart Association classification, if class three and class four are not including class two, here the QRS duration is between 120 and 149 milliseconds. Or if the left ventricular ejection fraction is less than 35% sinus rhythm, a non-left bundle branch uh, block pattern with a QRS duration should be equal or more than 150 milliseconds, and the New York Heart Association classification should be class three or ambulatory class four on guideline directed medical treatment. And it may be useful in patients with atrial fibrillation and ejection fraction of 35 or less on guideline directed medical therapy if the patient is requiring ventricular pacing 
or meeting CRT criteria and AV nodal ablation or pharmacological rate control will allow near 100% need for ventricular pacing. So here, biventricular pacing or cardiac insulinization therapy will be the most appropriate for these patients. Or if the patient with an ejection fraction of 35% or less and the functional class is three or four, while there is a frequent dependent on ventricular pacing or any other indication for cardiac pacing, here CRT would be a reasonable approach. This is an example of the patient with systolic dysfunction where the left bundle branch block is present with a QRS duration of 181 millisecond. And after CRT, the QRS duration is reduced to 120 millisecond. And this is X-ray of the patient before implantation of CRT where there is cardiomegaly and pulmonary venous congestion. After implantation of the CRT, the cardiac dimension and volumes have been reduced and the pulmonary vein congestion have been so much improved in this patient six weeks after implantation of the CRT. The final message is a contraindication to pacemaker. Like in any other procedure, uh, uh, the insertion of pacemaker should be chosen wisely for a particular patient. There are situations in which pacemaker insertion is not beneficial or not enough to support its use. So these are the contraindications of pacemaker. Sinus bradycardia without significant symptoms or asymptomatic first degree EV block. EV blocks that's expected to resolve and unlikely to recur, uh, like drug toxicity or any other uh, transient conditions. This maker is not indicated in sinus node dysfunction patient with symptoms suggestive of bradycardia that have been documented to occur even in the absence of bradycardia. So if uh, uh, the patient is asymptomatic, asymptomatic second uh, degree Mobitz type 1 EV block. Asymptomatic prolonged PR interval with atrial RR interval with atrial fibrillation or other causes of transient ventricular bosis. Hypersensitive carotid sinus uh, response to carotid sinus in the absence of symptoms or in the presence of vague symptoms like dizziness, lightheadedness. Asymptomatic bradycardia during sleep. CRT is not indicated in patients whose functional status and life expectancy are limited due to non cardiac conditions or in narrow complex patient less than 120 milliseconds or in right bundle branch block with left axis deviation without syncope or other symptoms compatible with intermittent AV block, long QT or torsade blood due to reversible causes like drugs or electrolyte abnormality, and the presence of an accessory pathway that had the capacity for rapid anti-grade conduction, and patients with New York Heart Association class one or two symptoms and non-left bundle branch pattern with a QRS duration less than 150 milliseconds. Also, as a procedure, there are some complications for pacing. <clears throat> the majority of these complications occur earlier, either during hospital stay or in the first six months. Lead complications like lead dislodgement, fracture, or failure are the main reasons for re-implantation or revision of the pacemaker system and CRT devices. Other complications include infections, hematoma formation on the site of a pocket formation, bricardial effusion or tamponade, pneumothorax, coronary sinus dissection or perforation during CRT implantation, all pacemakers were non-MRI safe or non-MRI compatible. Now, newer pacemakers are mostly MRI compatible devices. Final message is a clinical implication. One or two slides more to include the clinical implication of pacing and especially during CRT. Pacemaker implantation or CRT in heart failure patients has shown some mortality benefit, like here in the CARE heart failure study, which included patients with an indication for CRT. There has been an evidence from multiple randomized trials that these patients with CRTD and reduced ejection fraction show an improvement in the functional class and improving of the mortality rate in these patients on the long term, as indicated by these uh, long term studies. Also, the guidelines from 2012 thoroughly reviewed the conditions of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, genetic arrhythmia syndrome, terminal care and congenital heart disease, and no changes were made compared to the 2008 guidelines in these conditions, but there were some changes in the guidelines of CRT insertion from the, from the guidelines of 2008 to 2012. No new guidelines recommended CRT in patients with QRS duration greater than or equal of 150 millisecond instead of 120 millisecond based on multiple analyses and studies. An additional difference in CRT recommendation includes patients with a QRS duration greater or longer than 150 millisecond with a left bundle as a class one indication. Newer guidelines based on multiple studies suggest that in patients who have QRS greater or equal to 120 millisecond does not have complete left bundle branch block, the evidence is less compelling. 
Their bell society of cardiology guidelines are similar to the American guidelines with minimal differences. The major difference is noting in the European society guidelines having CRT indication via QRS indication, QRS duration less than or equal to 120 milliseconds in patients with atrial fibrillation in whom we have inadequately rate control requiring atrioventricular block, either by ablation or strong AV blocking drugs. The take home message to enhance the healthcare team outcome, there are some areas where the indications for pacemakers are not clear, but there are few areas where clinical judgment and expertise plays a greater role. Although the guidelines attempt to define practices that meet the needs for most patients, the ultimate decision for the patient should be based on the particular patient uh, scenario, clinical judgment and discussion with the patient about the risk benefit of the procedure of pacemaker implantation. There are specific pacemaker generators that are used for specific patients with AV block and sinus node dysfunction, depending upon the level of presentation and the requirements of the patient. Therefore, the, uh, the different types of generators include single chamber, dual chamber, or biventricular generator. Therefore, a cardiac electrophysiology consult is highly recommended uh, before the insertion of pacemaker, before the discussion for this uh, device maneuver insertion. And finally, I'd like to thank you and hope that our discussion today have elicited clearly the different forms of bradycardia indications for pacing and clearly the indications of pacemaker implantation in the different situations as accepted by the international guidelines. Thank you.